Well, in today's episode, I have with me Brent Campbell. He's the campus staff minister for InterVarsity at UNC Charlotte. Welcome, Brent. Glad you're here. Yeah, thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Well, how long have you been working with college students? Tell us a little bit about where, where what got you even into this. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I there's a difference between college students and, uh, you know, university. So yeah. I would say college students for probably nine years within Within a couple of weeks of me becoming a believer, I was leading a Bible study and started doing stuff, right? So, um, so, but then I graduated about two years later and been working with the university for um, finishing up six years. So I'll be starting wow. seven years in August. Well, tell us about even how you came to faith. Yeah, so uh, I'm from the South, uh, Wilmington, North Carolina. And um, I grew up son of pastors and um, the, like just the most amazing parents you could ever ask for. Like I grew up in the most incredible Christian incubator <laughs> you, could, you could possibly imagine. And so, um, so my story is not their fault. You know, it's not my parents' fault. But um, so I was going through the motions. I would say I was a well-meaning Pharisee. I um, had some form of godliness, very little power. Um, and all the little uh, tropes that come along with that. Uh, but I was like the most Christian Christian out of all my little Christian friends, leading youth group, leading worship, telling my atheist friends they were wayward and sinners and <laughs> with an appropriate amount of judgmentalness, you know, the whole thing. And um, But I didn't really know Jesus. And um, if you had told me that, I would have fought you. Like I would have been like, you're, you would have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, but it, it would have been true. And so um, there's a longer story, which I don't mind telling, but since, you know, <laughs> We don't have that much time. The shortest story is I'm, I was uh, on my way to make a suicide attempt my junior year of college. And I have this miraculous encounter with Jesus. Blows my mind. Um, I uh, have always been something of an obsessive person <laughs> and so and, and hyper logical. And so I got to this place of agnost, um, you know, like maybe agnosticism, maybe deism. But, but if God is real, he's not interested. Right. He, he's probably not real, but even if he is, he's certainly not interested in what's happening down here and got to that place. And for me, it was pretty logical. If God's not real, there's no hope. If there's no hope, there's no point. If there's no point. Why am I wasting my time? And I remember thinking, I don't know why more people don't kill themselves, but it's either because they're weak or they're stupid. And I'm not weak and I'm not stupid. So time to, you know, like time to die. Yeah. Wow. Hyper, hyper obsessive, hyper kind of logical person. So Either way, I, I end up on my way to make the suicide attempt, um, had this miraculous encounter with Jesus, blows my mind that God is real, not just like a book, not just uh, I go to a building and sing his songs and I cry sometimes, but like he's a, a person, real, like more real than me, like that was incredible to me. So, um, so yeah, I came to faith alone in my room, like 7 a.m., um, July 12th, uh, July 7th, rather. And um, in 2012, and uh, and that wow. was that. It was like this Damascus Road thing. So I was on fire after that. Well, you know, and it's it's hard not to consider, you know, your story a, a microcosm, perhaps of of our culture. You know, a lot of people grew up in Christianity, and then a lot of doubt and even hopelessness. And I love that a very logical person has an encounter with Jesus. If you don't mind sharing, yeah. like what, how did he become so real to you in that moment? Yeah, the, uh, yeah, I don't mind at all. It's, a, it's the best story in the world. I almost always cry, you know, so here we go. Um, it, but I'll, I'll, I'll truncate it. Um, essentially, I had been praying this, I'd been going to different Christian mentors in my life, um, asking for help because I'm like, bro, I am hurting. Like, I'm not in a good place. And they start, you know, they're giving me advice, but I was not interested whatsoever. Um, and so either way, I had decided I was I was going to die. Didn't want to do it in my house. My mom find me. And as sort of a last, you know, some, some homage to my parents, I was like, I will pray because I know they will wonder, did he pray? Did he try the little sky fairy thing? Did he try? And I want to be able to die with integrity, so I'll pray. Um, and so I pray this prayer for about an hour and um, just alone in my room and nothing happens. So I don't know what I was thinking would happen, but nothing happens. And I've been praying this prayer over and over. God, take away the pain. Uh, give me the grace to forgive her. Give me peace. 
right? Mm. Because there was this relationship in my life that to say it went south would have just been, would do it in injustice, but it wasn't good. Mm. Mm. Uh, and that was the final straw. So either way, I, uh, after about an hour, I literally, I remember I stood up in my room, I looked up <laughs> to my ceiling. You know, it's funny, every atheist is mad at God, even though we're not existing. Um, right. And so I'm like, hey, I always thought you weren't real. But now I know for sure. You said if I ever needed you, you'd be there for me. And I need you now more than ever. And where are you? Nowhere. Mm. So I grab my keys. I go to the car. I had this whole plan. I killed myself at my old high school. And um, as I'm going to the car, I have this overwhelming urge to go back and pray. I wouldn't have said that that was the Lord at the time. Now I know it was the Lord. But at the time, I was just like, oh, I'm just scared. And it's okay. I have all the time in the world. I'm going to die. So I technically have, you know, once again very logical i'm like i have all the time who cares if i go back you should be afraid to die you know that's not an illogical thing so i go back and i just think i'm wasting time because i'm afraid to do this thing and i was like whatever i'll go back and pray some more get to my room on my knees really rock bottom scraping the bottom of rock bottom you know crying mm -hmm. crying crying and i'm praying this prayer god give me the grace to forgive her take away the pain give me peace um and um i in the middle of the word peace like I'm like I'm hysterically crying, mm. all the fluids coming out of all of the orifices <laughs> on my right. face, um, and in the middle of the word peace, I start laughing. Right, so it, God, give me the grace to forgive her, take away the pain, give me peace. Ha 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 ha. Like, and I and it's not a normal laughter. It's like you know I it was so abrupt and so uncontrollable. I thought I had gone insane. So I'm I'm literally laughing. I'm and now I'm sitting on the edge of my bed. I'm laughing. And uncontrollably, and I'm like, I just snapped. Like, I think oh, I'm crazy. Like, I'm like freaking out. And and um, I hear this voice in my head. I didn't hear it audibly, but I heard it in my head. And the best thing I could explain it as is it would be like if you were singing your ABCs, you're singing the song to yourself. And then someone, another voice, just like the song you hear, uh, the voice you hear singing that song, started counting to 10 at the same time. You know it's not you because you're, you, you know, and so I'm talking to myself and I'm saying, man, I guess I'm crazy. And I'm starting to think, I'm like, what am I going to do now? I guess my mom's going to take it. You know, like I'm going down this road of like, I'm insane now. And I hear this voice cut me off and say, no, it's me. Wow. And I knew, I was like, I know who this is. You know what I'm saying? Like, it was, it was incredible. And I feel these arms wrap around me, not like in an emotional way, but like, like if I came up behind you, and I hugged you like this. Wow. And, I, and so I turn around, but I'm on the edge of my bed. So there's just behind me, there's just more bed. I turn around and I'm like, what was that? Like, I'm freaking out. Wow. So I'm looking around and I'm like, what is going on? And hear the Lord say again, no, it's me. And um, to say more of the story it would take too long, but just end up talking, talking with God. And, and maybe it was, you know, in Second Corinthians, when Paul's like, "Hey, I know a man who was caught up into the third heaven, whether in the body or in the, in the spirit, I do not know." But he, you know, he's caught up and heard inexpressible things that should not be uttered, and all these different things, right? And um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it quite that, but I had this moment after that with the Lord, where it's even nine years later, and much theology, I do not have adequate words to express, except for I don't know. I had this conversation with God, as clear as I'm talking to you. And he essentially, it was like three things. He was very sarcastic with me, which was very helpful for me at the time. And was like, hey, you broke the first rule. You, um, you made her an idol. Mm. He said, you made her an idol. That's literally the first rule, like it's sarcastically. And I was like, oh, that's, I never thought of it that way, you know. And the second thing was, if you had ever asked me, I would have told you she wasn't the one for you. And Because I had this deep despair. I'd been dating this woman for four years. I was trying to marry her, this mm. whole thing, right? And it ended real, real bad. Um, and he brought back these memories over the previous four years. Uh, it just like a Rolodex or something, like a movie montage. Remember that? That was me trying to get your attention. Wow. Remember that? That was me. Remember that? That was me. I never meant for this to happen, but you wanted your life on your terms. And this is what your life gets you. Wow. I was like, that My makes goodness, sense. Brent, this is amazing. Right. Really? I mean, it was incredible. And then the third thing was, if... If you will follow me and stop running from what I've called you to do, I can give you a whole life of peace. Mm. And so I was like, sign me up, bro. Like, what are you talking about? Okay. So I have this in encounter and it just completely, once again, I'm still the hyper obsessive <laughs> person, but now I'm like, oh, well, if God's real, then I'm an idiot. 
Wow. I've been living my life wrong. Everything in this book is true. And um, it was just kind of a, a, a switch that went That's on. That's remarkable. So that was going into my junior year of college, the summer, a, a month before junior year starts. Wow. Well, what I think is so amazing about that story, and I hope gives a lot of hope to people that, that have a heart for post Christian ministry, sort of that person that's been inoculated. They know all the answers. And, and in the end, they've rejected God, but didn't really actually know him. I feel mm. like your story is just a powerful example of what God can do when someone opens their heart and mind. And, you know, part of, part of what you do now is helping yeah. other people who were your age at the time follow Jesus. You're on a, a you know, well-known college campus. What are you guys with InterVarsity doing that is effective at reaching and discipling a post-Christian uh, crowd? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the things I really appreciate about InterVarsity is uh, the level of trust and contextualization I'm allowed to have. Like, like they trust me a lot. My supervisors, they trust me. Um, obviously, they weigh in, they give advice, but it's just me on campus. They, I mean, you know, it's just me. Mm -hmm. And so they've extended all this trust. And so when I come up with a new idea or mm, we're going to do it this way or whatever, they're like, well, if that's what the spirit's leading, you know, what you know after the guardrails? Like, and, and so I love that. So shout out to them. Shout out to my supervisors. But uh, in particular, the it's interesting, the ministry that I feel like I've gotten to be a part of at UNC Charlotte has been largely with desperate people. I had another friend describe it as, he's like, you're... Your chapter is like a, in the university, we call them chapters, like the, yeah. your chapter is like a hospital, <laughs> you know, like that's what it's right. like. Wow. Um, and I wasn't in necessarily anticipating that, but tends to be a lot of desperate people who are much like me, either they grew up in church and they're like, I'm done, or they're far from the Lord, right, and with lots of questions they don't feel like they have answers to. Um, and I would say there's a high, high proportion. I would say maybe 70%. And for sure, this is true at one point in time. Like, it, it may be less true now. Um, but for sure, there was a time where 70, 80% of the people who were in IV at UNC Charlotte had made a suicide attempt, been wow. raped or molested, you know. And that's a big part of my story. I was sexually abused when I was younger and all these. Mm. So all these things I didn't even know there was redemption for. Um, wow. And uh, so interestingly enough, when I got to the chapter... I'm me, <laughs> I'm me, and so I'm a little intense, and um, uh, we, either way, sorry, I'm, uh, let me take the short way around. Um, there's a couple of things that we we did immediately that were a little different. So we stopped having worship, we stopped having people come in and preach, we stopped um, pretty much, <laughs> we stopped playing games, we stopped doing get-to-know-you events, like, we, I mean, everything that you could think of, like, oh, this is campus ministry, like, the campus ministry started back, we stopped all of that um, immediately, which automatically, you know, uh, put some people away, right, they're like, this is not what we signed up for, um, but you and say Charlotte, you know, it's, Charlotte's like the buckle of the Bible belt, you, you throw a stone in the air, yeah, and you're going to hit a church, and so, um, and UNC Charlotte's not that different. There was a lot of campus ministries doing great work. And I felt like, man, believers have been reached here. Mm -hmm. Like, but I didn't feel like the people who had the doubts like like I'd had, I didn't feel like they'd been reached. Mm -hmm. So, and I had a plan for like, okay, if we if we're successful, if the culture we're trying to create is successful, then I'm gonna have students who wanna bring their Muslim friend. And if you wanna bring your Muslim friend and the first thing he has to do is sing songs to a God he doesn't believe in, then maybe your group is not for your Muslim friend, you know? Um, yeah. So I, you know, I just started going on. And same thing with multi-ethnicity. I grew up, that's another, we can <laughs> invite me back and I'll talk about growing up in the racist South, but I grew up hating white people until I became a Christian. Um, mm -hmm. And God really healed a lot of that. But wow. uh, one of the multi-ethnic community and one of the biggest barriers is preference, right? Mm -hmm. So everyone has their little preferences. I don't like that song. I don't like the way we talk about that. I, it's like, and so I was like, okay, we got to get that, get that out of the way. So now there's no more music. Right. So now everyone's happy because no one's happy. There's no more music, right? So we just started looking at this stuff. And um, I mean, surprisingly, I, I did it mostly because I was convicted, not necessarily because I thought it was going to be super fruitful or whatever, but the Lord just um, blessed it. And so wow. we started seeing people come to faith and um, people uh, experiencing miracles and um we had an, uh, an agnostic 
a guy come to faith partly because he prayed healing for his girlfriend. Wow. Was not a believer and he didn't believe in it. And there was just a, you know, there was just a moment. We don't do that all the time, but it was just a moment. It felt like, oh, well, I guess it's hard to read this part of the Bible and then say this doesn't happen. You know, like <laughs> someone's yeah. lying. Is it me? You know, who, who's lying here? I don't know. Right. Um, and so, but he became a believer because of that. Wow, right? that's he amazing. Um, so yeah, God is just, it's been really, really cool. And it's mostly been by engaging non-traditionally. So we don't have people preach. We print up scriptures, we ask questions, and I force them to ask the hard questions. Like, why does it, why isn't God being a jerk right now? Like in this passage, why is, it, is this stupid or not? You know, like, and so we're engaging um, people sort of where they are and, and, um, and high vulnerability, right? Like uh, starting with me. Right. And so people know about my abuse. They know about I'll I'll go in before a it, it's this type of stuff that I found has been really um, effective for them. It's just wow. authentic is the point. Yeah. I think yeah. you're hitting on a, a few things, you know, being okay with doubt, authenticity, vulnerability, wrestling with the scriptures. What, what do you call the event? And and what do people say when they're inviting that Muslim friend or agnostic friend? They're inviting them to like I'd just love to even hear the language you guys use. Yeah, so there's this you know every culture has its own little stuff lingo, and so the inherited lingo from university is large group and small group, right? Small groups right. are these large group is kind of like your capital type service. So we played around with changing the name, but it just became a little confusing. So we still call it that. Um, if a student's inviting a, a friend, they're saying, hey, like you should, they're normally inviting people to meet someone, right? They're saying, hey, you should come meet my friends. Interesting. Yeah. Or you should come meet Brent, you know, or whatever, right? Like yeah. it's a lot more of that. Um, and, and they'll normally say it's like a Bible study if, if pressed, right? It's certainly not a service. Um, and um, we it was a pretty normal thing like we would start at seven and we'd be there till 2 a.m wow and that was like a weekly a weekly thing and not because we're it's not all bible study but it's the sort of environment where you you stay you're forced to interact with people you're building friendships there's you're staying in the room people are praying with each other it's this high high vulnerability which leads to, I mean, there's tons of dumb stuff, right? Like not every, not every part of a community is great. We, we have our sin, but um, if I was to highlight the good stuff that God has really done, it's, it's been um, meeting people in the middle of high vulnerability um, and showing himself to people of like, I cannot give you an answer. Um, and so, and so that's become pretty normal. That's amazing. What are some of the questions you, that seem to come up every semester? I mean, part of the challenge, I'm sure, for you and campus ministry, it's almost like restarting every year. Every that is, it's the worst. <laughs> it's yeah. the worst. You're doing all this work and you graduate people that you're like, oh, and you have to start over again. You have to refresh the culture every year. Yeah, for sure. Um, some of the most of it, I mean, there's no new questions, right? It's repackaged old questions and the problem of evil and 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 different things around theodicy and. And some of like the relevancy of the scriptures, the trustworthiness of Jesus. It's actually starting to, the questions are changing a bit because people don't much care how reliable the Bible is anymore. It's not a big thing. Um, it's more like, so what? Hmm. Right? So people, everyone's religious now. You're a weirdo if you're an atheist. Like, that's weird. Right. I don't mean atheists anymore there and there and if i do they're like the odd ones out everyone's spiritual um agnostic they don't even have language for it when i talk to people i'm like oh so what are you like agnostic and they're like what does that mean and then i explain they're like i mean i guess but they don't even like the label they're just like right. yeah kind of spiritual and and their beliefs are undefined um and so it, it's a lot of it is the same questions but they're coming from a different place they don't they don't receive the Bible as authoritative. That's not something even worth arguing about, trying to prove, right? Because it's like, right. even if you're done, they're like, okay, so, <laughs> you know, and that was true for me. I grew up in church, I grew up in black church, okay? So there's not a whole bunch of <laughs> asking questions. It's like, hey, here's what you're gonna do and this is what's gonna happen, right? And so that was new for me to meet people who were completely unconcerned with whether or not the Bible was accurate, true, trustworthy. Um, 
So we're we're trying to help reintroduce them to the lordship of Jesus through risks, hmm. right? It, it, mostly through miracle, right? And it's not because we're not like a super Pentecostal sort of thing. It, it was just the missiological approach, which is if you're reaching a people group who don't believe God has authority and are not interested in your little book whatsoever, then you have to find a way to prove to them that God has authority worth listening to before they get to the book, because they don't care about what the book says, right? Mm -hmm. So so if the entryway then becomes, hey, if you'll, um, <laughs> what, well, there's been different methods, right? But I'm, I'm challenging people to take a risk. Hey, we just read this passage. So that means if you do what's in this passage and then you don't experience the end part of this passage, God's a liar. And if God's a liar, you shouldn't come back and you should pity us. And you should, you should tell everyone else not to come back. But if you do it and then he does it, then you should not be an idiot and you should follow Jesus, right? And <laughs> And that's, and it's kind of like, ha, 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 but they're, you know, but then they do it. And then wow. God is dope because he's dope. And, um, you know, and, and you, obviously all the caveats, you have to be wise. You don't say that every single week to every single right. person. That's not their issue. Right. But, but we've leaned into, okay, if God's real and he's trustworthy, then he has to be the one who proves himself trustworthy to you. Wow. Um, and I can help guide you after that. Um, so it's, Man, it's mm -hmm. it's it's been dope. <laughs> wow, it sounds remarkable. And and you know our mutual friend Andy Muick, I'm grateful for the introduction. And he but he just was going on and on about the creative way you're reaching people that aren't being reached. And you know you talk about everybody kind of having their own different spirituality and philosophy. You know I'm sure you've heard of the phrase you know moralistic therapeutic deism. You know and, and it, there is something about that in our culture. And what I love you're doing is you're taking it head on with the Lordship of Jesus and his authority. That's just remarkable. Maybe yeah. share another story about seeing someone try what you talked about and yeah. God coming through. Okay, great story, great story. And, and I want to, in full disclosure, because I'm like, you know, I already said obsessive and I'm like, you know, I'm all, all the way down the line. Not all of these stories have, um, like even the story I'm going to tell, I'm not sure where this person's at in their faith now. Right. This is three or four years old. So I know he's close to the Lord, but, you know, anyways. Um, but, okay, so perfect example, how a guy come in to Bible study, a uh, non-traditional student. He actually doesn't even go to UNC Charlotte, but he gets invited from a, by a friend. And that was a big thing. Like, whoever, if you're, if you're under 30, you can come to our chapter, okay? It's just like, right. we're just not, you know, it's, it's fine. Um and so, so he gets invited by a friend. Um, he's, uh, he, he wouldn't call himself an atheist, but that's essentially what he is, um, was sharing how, well, either way, I didn't know all of this. I just knew he wasn't religious. And so he comes to Bible study and we're asking some sort of questions and things get deep because things tend to um, in the way that we're talking about the question, because that's part of the goal. The way we structure the night is that people are going to be forced to as gently as possible, but to engage vulnerably about their own life, not just about musing about what could be, but like, where are you in this, right? And in the middle of that shared vulnerability, there's trust, right? Because I have ammo on you, you have ammo on me. If we leave here and share this, we ruin each other's lives. We're not going to do that. So now there's this bond, there's this kinship. So uh, halfway through the night, he stops me. We had, I can't remember quite what we were talking about, but he sort of said, I'm, I'm making a claim of lordship, like Jesus is Lord and he's real and he's true. And, and, and you, God is inviting you to take a step of trust and a law and, and we can talk about what that looks like. And so he pauses me. I'm in, the, you know, I'm in the middle. I'm going for it. You know, and he's like, oh, can I ask a question? I'm like, oh, okay, go ahead. And um, he starts telling a story about how his, um, he stopped believing in God because he would pray to God every night to, um, uh, stop his stepdad from beating him and his, beating his mom and how God never answered. And he goes through this long, vulnerable story about how he'd been grown up abused and he prayed these prayers a hundred times and no one ever answered. And so clearly if God's real, he's an asshole and you know, the whole thing. Yeah. And, and so I'm stuck and scared, terrified uh, <laughs> because I'm like, okay, like mm -hmm. Lord, he's here. You knew he would be here. I did not know, but you knew. And so he's talking, I'm trying to hear the Lord. I'm like, okay, man, what's, you know, what am I supposed to do? 
And I really felt like the only thing I felt came come to mind was Brent, if he's here, then he's here because I brought him here. And you should respond to him as if I'm here too, right? Mm. That's how you should respond to him. You should respond to him like I'm real, like I'm real and I brought him here. Wow. I'm like, okay. So I'm like, hey, so you feel like God's ever answered a prayer for you? You feel like God's ever spoken to you? And he's like, no, I don't think he has. And I was like, okay, so after this, I was like, do you have time tonight? He's like, yeah, I have some time. I was like, okay, so after it's over, stay back. We're going to pray together and God is going to speak to you. And it's not going to be because I told you he spoke to you, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to have your own encounter with the Lord because he brought you here. So, and he knew you were going to bring this up and he wants you to, right? Uh, and so that's what we're going to do. I'm terrified. I almost peed on myself. I do not want to do that. <laughs> I'm faking it till I make it. I'm like, okay, Lord, that's, a, that's what I think, right? So uh, night's over. We pray together. Just really simple, but God shows up, right? So he ends up becoming a Christian is the point. There's a longer story, but he wow. becomes a Christian, right? And so he's like, well, what do I do next? And uh, we were in the middle of a prayer challenge of like, we're, we're taking risks, like evangelistic risks. And I was like, okay, so here's what you're going to do. You're going to wake up tomorrow morning and you're going to ask God, God, is there anything you want me to do today? And even if you're not sure what it is, you're going to do it. Right. And that's all I want you to do until I see you next week. And he's like, are you sure? Anything else? That's it. All I want you to do is you wake up and you ask God, if there's anything you want me to do today, will you get my attention and I'll do it. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm wrong. Well, if you're wrong, then you look like an idiot for Jesus. It's a long line of disciples behind you. Same thing. You're fine. You know? So he does. He comes back next week. He's on fire. He's like, I got a testimony to share. Okay. So he ends up sharing how he's like, I did that. And, and we, this is one of the mantras of the community, like simple obedience, right? Like if it's not going to kill you and it's not heretical, just do it. Yeah. Just like, what are you, you know, right. so we practice that. We model that. We practice it. So he comes back, mind you, he doesn't go to school. He's like, I didn't know, I'm, I'm giving these encouragements to all these people who live on campus. They can witness to their friends. They live in dorms. They have this whole, they're in this whole system that's built um, for the stuff I'm saying. But he's like, I work at 7-Eleven all day long, like for 10 hours a day. I'm not in school. I don't know how this could apply to me. But so he comes back, tells a story of how he's working at 7-Eleven, sees a guy come in at, 8 a.m., buy some alcohol, come back by, you know, 8 p.m. to buy some alcohol. And when he came in the first time, he felt like God was saying to him to pray for the guy. He's like, I've never prayed for anybody. I don't even know what that means and blah, blah, blah. And so he spent the rest of the day convicted of like, but Brent said, just like, you know, do the thing. So he does, the guy comes back in. He's like, this is an opportunity. Like, God is helping me <laughs> be faithful. And so he asked the guy, hey, can I pray for you? Are you okay? Like, blah, blah, blah. And it sparks up this conversation dude stays, waits for him to get off work. They pray together in the um, parking lot. Um, and he's a week old in the faith, right? He doesn't wow. know anything, anything. And he's like, I don't know what to do, but I'm just going to do what Brent did with me. And one of the things I said was like, I can't remember what I said at the time, but I was like, hey, so I just want you to pray out loud and ask, what I say? ask the Holy Spirit to ask God if there's anything he wants to say. I, I can't remember. It was something dumb and stupid that was like, God, I hope you're <laughs> I hope making you look dumb. You know? Um, man, I can't I can't remember quite the words I said, but that's all he knows, right? So he's like, he's talking to the dude, and, and the dude's like, Well, what made you, you know, pray for me? And and he's like, Well, you know, I just became a Christian and blah blah blah. And 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 so the dude tells him, Well, yeah, I'm actually depressed. My wife doesn't know, but um, this deep thing in his life and nobody knows. So you're the only person I've told and I've just been drinking because wow. I'm a grown man, 40, 40 year old guy. So you got a 22 year old and a 40 year old. And he's like, man, it's okay because like Jesus can fix that. And he's like, I mean, yeah, sure. Okay. And he's like, no, seriously. Um, hey, close your eyes and I'm going to pray for you. And then Jesus is going to fix it. Oh my that's, all know. that's all I know. Right? And he's like, okay. And so he, <laughs> he prays for him some simple little prayer and the dude starts breaking down crying and he looks at him and he says what is happening i feel holiness coming from you wow the thing you would say i mean that's a weird thing right and so the dude rededicates his life to the lord in the parking lot wow and so it's the best story because there 
it's the simplicity of the childlike faith. Now, you you and me can think of 1.2 million scenarios where that goes very, very wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it's not, um, but I will say that the grace that the Lord, I find that the grace God gives to these, I mean, children, they're not children, but like these yeah. child, these people. Childlike who are, faith, for sure. I like faith. You're like, okay, you know, it says it in it says it in this book. Yeah, I guess maybe it's true. I and love that. I was extended in those moments, uh, and so that was that was a really cool and encouraging time uh, testimony for uh, our community. But I would say at that time it wasn't novel. Wow! Like it was, God did it again. You know, mm-hmm. I don't think they realized because most of these people are either unchurched or something like it. So I don't think they really they fully realized. Right. Yeah. Uh, Oh, yeah. That's all. I love it. Brent, you are doing such an amazing job. And I'm so grateful for a little bit of time with you today. Thanks for sharing some of your story with us. Keep up the great work. Of course, man. Thank you.